so, let's see. I didn't, this is good. I didn't take my notes for the first part of this. So I'm going to win it. All right, let's see how good this is. Look how good I really am. I don't have any notes for this. Never left off, right? We were talking about uh, these Venetian portraits, which we'll talk quite a bit more about um, down at the National Gallery. The Titian portrait on your right, which has been called Titian up until the last few years, um, with the VVO, which means, you know, made by the living for the living, picks up on a very old and traditional kind of portrait that has this parapet in the foreground. That's what Bellini has been doing with all of his portraits, right? And you can see he tried to mix it up a bit, whomever the artist might be. Tried to mix it up a bit by adding a sort of step up on that parapet on the far right. And you can still see the ghost of the parapet, not only there, but through the book on the left. Right, so originally it was just going to be a sort of simple figure separated by that wall. That it seems to derive in a way from the the half lake Madonnas. Right? Not entirely dissimilar from that. And I think if we if we think about what the was trying to achieve with those half lake Madonnas, the sense of a real presence, right? In front of you. That, that I think that kind of bleeds over into these portraits. Now, Giorgione, uh sort of mixes it up a bit, so does Christian as we get deeper into the 16th century. Comes up with new types, um, in this case the paired portrait of the young student with his tutor, uh, and we sort of went through this, how the elements that uh, the young man is holding uh, are indeed sort of the idea of the arch. And, and we saw that for Venice, these were seen as virtuous Right, remember the Watto picture where uh, the spreading tool, the compass, and the flute were both signs of virtue when in practice, but not when they're not being used, right? And that's exactly what the motto says on the scroll, right? The talent is a virtue when you use it, right? It's only a virtue when you use it, yeah? Many people identify him as an astronomer because he's got the armillary sphere for measuring the heavens. But as we talked about in the class, this could just be the idea of the universe of ideas, right? That he's getting a rounded education, as you guys are. Uh, you're a theory, right? He's getting his liberal arts core, as it were. Um, the idea of measurement... Uh, coupled with other pursuits is seen in other works. I'm going to look at Sebastiano del Piombo. And this is where I really would have my, my notes because I don't have him memorized by any means. Um, I've never taught Sebastiano before. But here's a beautiful life-size portrait of a humanist from the National Gallery where he is greeting you, the viewer. He's taken off his gloves. He's a gentleman, right? But he, he wants to feel close and personal to you. So he's holding his gloves, waiting to shake your hand as you get into the room. We don't know who he is, but it sure does seem as if he's a, uh, a commissioned portraitist. Sebastiano was born in Venice, was trained in Venice, but like many of the other artists we've seen who came out of this same generation, he worked under George Oning Tissom. As he came of age, he figured out that Venice was a kind of a crowded field, and he ended up going elsewhere. And Sebastiano's case, he went all the way to Rome where he made quite a name for himself in Rome. And you would think, well, geez, you know, Venice is crowded. You go to Rome? Who's in Rome at this time? Michelangelo and Raphael. Right? Michelangelo and Raphael are in Rome. But the Pope in Rome, Julius II, is spending money hand over fist on art. And so are members of his circle who are following his example. So there's a lot more patronage, I think, in many ways. And Sebastiano ends up getting to Rome. This is really kind of fascinating. So I'm way ahead of myself here. But he gets to Rome just as Michelangelo is finishing the Sistine ceiling. Okay? So Michelangelo has gone to Rome. Michelangelo started in Florence in 1506, maybe 1505. He gets a summons from Pope Julius II to come to Rome to work for him. And Michelangelo is a sculptor. Up to this point, he's, he's done a couple paintings, but he's making his name as a sculptor. And Julius, the Pope, wants Michelangelo to work on his tomb. Tomb sculpture never happens after you die. It happens before you die. And he can't say what's there, right? These days, we buy headstones after people are dead, right? 
Because we're not looking for a three-story, life-size, 27 life-size sculptures in a sort of makeshift house, which is what Julius wants. But she wants to get a bunch of other big sculptures for him. And then he says, well, listen, I got this feeling. The 15th season, right? I didn't that as well. And Michael does not want to do it. He's a, he's a sculptor. He doesn't want to do it. Right? So he's just about finished with the Sistine ceiling when Sebastiano shows up. And because of the Sistine ceiling, Michelangelo has a bunch of other commissions that people wanted to do, and he starts to shovel them to Sebastiano. He's never. So he lucked out, right? He goes to Rome, and he starts to pick up the, you know, the crumbs around Michelangelo. He doesn't want it to be located. Okay? Now, in this particular work, we see going back now. That gives us a bit of context for this work. He starts in, 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 uh, in Venice and moves to Rome. But so this is after he's moved to Rome. But it shows the lessons he learned in Venice because it's totally Venetian color. Right? It has that sort of misty, uh, diffuse kind of color that seems to fill the air around the objects that have that particular color, right? So the color of the blue on the globe, you begin to see reflected on the book behind it, right? The color of green and that carpet, or the, uh, the hanging behind it, sort of seems to diffuse into the air around it. This is from the lessons he got from studying, um, in, uh, in, uh, Venice before moving to Rome. Um, on the table are these objects that again identify him as a scholar and as a humanist, right? And that's exactly, I think, what's going on for Garini. That he's not a painter, he's not a musician, he's not a geometer, right? In the same way that our humanist here is not necessarily a geographer, he may be not his own, not only a writer, right? But he's someone who knows the value of all of these things and being able to do each and every one of them. Right? That's part of a good, a good education, even today. Right? I did a lot of poking around to see if anybody's really dug into this and see if we can identify which globe it is, whether or not it mattered where we're looking on the globe, like how it's been turned. I'd like to think it is. A great thing for somebody to research. I can't even figure out what what kind of we're looking at there. Is it the same? I guess I can figure it out, right? It, it looks like it's weird, this one, but it's backwards. You know? And so anyway, that's that meant to be one of those things, right? I don't have to tell you all the answers. I can sort of raise these questions. Okay, this is what I would ask. If I if I had chosen this to pass me on for a uh, research topic, I would try to figure out if we could identify that globe, and if we could figure out exactly what maybe is, we, you can see we can't read the words in the book, right? But there's that little cue there that starts off something and is indented, and that suggests that maybe if we can't identify the book itself, we can identify what kind of book it is. It's kind of cool, right? And then we can say, well, maybe that is a medical treatise, right? Or maybe it tells us it's a legal treatise, right? That would help to understand the picture better, right? What kind of books had those little ribbons tied on them uh, that we see here? Does that identify those books, right? So these are, I don't have the answers. I just have the question, right? Yes. Um, the great Sebastiano is an absolute power in this guy. And obviously, I mean, it's a cardinal, right? Cardinal Bantanello Fauci. And so that tells us the Roman period, right? Because cardinals, that's where they live. They're part of the, the court around the papacy, so this is painted after he's moved from Venice to Rome. And so the Sally in the middle, uh, again, you'll notice he's taking his gloves off to treat us, right? Very polite and gentlemanly and warm, right? And he's looking directly out of us. And then on the left, uh, looking a little bit like, like, like Butthead, uh, from Beavis and Butthead. Uh, right? You almost know, hey, hey. But, uh, there he is. Um, that's his secretary. And then the fellows on the right are identified as geographers simply because of the book they have open, and they seem to be discussing it. Right? And we've seen these gestures, right? George Jonah gave Smith as a teaching gesture. Right? So, there's teaching. Okay. But here's pointing to somebody to bigger ideas. Right? No, it's not like the Italian <laughs> 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 Yeah, and, and they, well, they are. They're talking with, uh, 
don't know what that is. But I, I don't know. Okay, there's a book of geography open, and you can make that out right out of the detail of that. Um, nice detail. Right? And again, I would love to know exactly what book that is, because there's a good chance that could be identified. It looks like it's a hand-painted and hand-written geographical manual. But just because they have a book of geography open, when you see them, it's humanist learning, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that they're geographers. Right? That, they, part of being a Renaissance man, there's that term, a Renaissance man. A Renaissance man can do anything. Right? They're equally adept in music and art and literature and law, right? Logic and rhetoric and geography and biology and Leonardo da Vinci does everything well, right? So, simply because they're discussing uh, uh, what is obviously a, a manual of geography, and I, maybe not, maybe it's, maybe it's a pilgrim's book. Right? Show us the various travels. Maybe it's a historical book. There are great, there are these great travel books from the Middle Ages that kept being used in the Renaissance, like the travels of Sir John Mandeville, Marco Polo's travels. Right? Uh, what's to say it's not that? It's early in the, well, not in the middle of the book, but still it could be something that, you know, you ever get a, you ever get a copy of, uh, Lord of the Rings and you go there, there's some half of the Middle Earth. Right? If you have it open to that page, it doesn't mean you're a geographer. So. Anyway, uh, that's what they call it, right? Um, now, Sebastiano's work here is incredibly realistic, and I think this comes out of his studies under Bellini, right, uh, before he left Venice. And it's just so crystalline and sharp, and that bell, right, that sits on the table, which is where you go, ding, 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 come and, you know, come to my, uh, to, he's greeted us. He's rang that bell, and we've come in. And it's so three-dimensionally accurate. And uh, it has a sense that you can almost reach into the picture and grab it, right? And this is true everywhere we look. Uh, the realism of his hands, we'll see that as well. Uh, the rug on the table. I was doing some reading on this, and they, 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 uh, people who do textile history, um, refer to rugs based on how they appear in pictures, because the best preserved examples of certain kinds of rugs are in paintings. Because other examples get worn out, right? So they actually refer to things as being lotto rugs, because they appear in the a lot, and this is a lotto rug, because ones of this type appear in a lot of lotto paintings. Versus, say, a whole buying rug, which would be from Northern Europe. Okay. Um, there's our bell, and a beautiful thing, right? Just painted there, and it sits on the table. He understands perspective, three-dimensional modeling. Um, on the bell are a couple of constrictions uh, up here. I, no, I don't have this. But down here, these the Saudi cards. So they have one, right? Bernardo de Saudi cards. Right? This is his bell. And that's how we know who it is. I think we can just go back and know who it is. These are the cards. And that helps us. And I forget what the top part is all about. I don't know. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. But, Sebastian, what's fine here on these paper that's been tacked into this carpet? That's a very convenient sort of thing to do, right? That's exactly where he picked it up. And that sort of realism that we see both in the bell and the signature is picked up in other details. A wonderful close up of the ring on his finger, that garnet ring that ties into his role as cardinal, right? Wearing the red. Of, of the cardinal. He has one ring on his ring finger on his left hand, and on his right hand, uh, what appears to be a signet ring. And again, I want to know what that signet is. And if we look at the way it is, right, it's upside down for the way he would view it, because it would be right side up if he had his hand like this. Right? That would be the right side way of looking at that, whatever that iconography is. Um, so, it's not Photoshop, or not Photoshop, but PowerPoint reveals it. So what is that? I, I don't, again, I don't know. I want to find out, right? Because uh, it probably helps identify him, but it would also give us some insight into the character's valley if he's chosen this particular signature. But you'll notice that uh, for all of the interesting color, right, which comes out of his Venetian training, he's a terrific draftsman. Right? He's a true, he, his ability to render 
So when people talk about Venetian painting, we start about to talk about Venetian painting this way as well. We get so wrapped up in the atmosphere and the color and the harmony of the different tones. And when people talk about it, they say, hey, Venice is the home of painters, whereas Florence and Rome are the homes of draftsmen. These guys can draw, right? These guys are really good at rendering. And in fact, I was doing some reading on Giorgione, and Giorgione's underdrawings, he's a fantastic. So there, there are no slouches by any means. They're not like a one-trick pony. And with that idea of being a terrific draftsman, right, is this fly that's resting on the knee of Bandanello Fowley. Right? And what intrigues me most about this fly, and I think I talked to you guys about it downtown, right, is the way that he painted it is not that the fly is resting on his leg. But he's painted it as if the fly is resting on the surface of the pan. So it fools your eye into thinking it's a real fly. Um, when I was reading about this, this is, really, this is a fun little detail, right? Apparently, on numerous occasions when this picture has been published, somebody in the magazine side who didn't know any better cleaned the fly off because they thought it had landed on the photo. Right? They thought it had landed on the picture, so they went ahead and just cleaned it up so when it's published, it's not there. Right? Uh, they thought it was a blemish. It's just that beautifully done. I love how the fly's eye picks up the color of that garnet ring and the color of this robe and the color of the table as well. But you can see from the shadow cast, right? That the fly, and it's also seems to be an afterthought, right? The whole thing is the robe and it's full of the painted person that sets what's over the top of it. But um, the fly resting on the surface of the picture is something that uh, Spectrum has chosen to do. Here I have an answer, right? The rest of the time I don't know that. Here it goes directly back to a really famous myth about artists from ancient Greece. Okay? So under, I don't think I have it over my slide. So under uh, Alexander the Great, the emperor of Greece. He's roughly, roughly 330 BC or so. Okay? And he had working for him as a court artist, an artist named Helix, who was reputed to be the greatest artist anywhere in the world. And he was mentioned. But the king of Greece was the greatest artist. And we find that numerous times in history when artists have had a court position. They'll often refer to themselves as modern artists. Greatest artist living and the core artist of Alexander the Great. Now, there is the legend of a great art contest between Kelly and his great rival, Horatius. They each were going to make a painting, and he would judge, they would judge each other. You might imagine something like this. What ends up happening is this legend plays out. Because until he paints a picture of a bowl of grapes. And it's so realistic. Realism is the, is the head of the poor. They don't worry about the right? They don't worry about real. Okay? Until he is so realistic, he paints it very so realistic that birds fly down. That's how it happens. He fools. It's so realistic that the first thing the painting is the real thing. You ever try to show a dog a picture? Even a photograph, right? Animals aren't cool, they see the two-dimensional. But Kelly is that good, okay? So he's going to win, he's going to win. They went over to what Horatius had painted. And they see a canvas there that's been covered halfway with a curtain. And Kelly goes over and goes, oh, what are you painting for? And he says, look at how you guys want that. It's a painting curtain. Right? So Horatius fooled the greatest artist in the world. Right? By painting a curtain over the field. So a teller can fool nature. But Horatius can fool the artist. This idea of a fly that's lit here, not only can it be seen as sort of, you know, 
they're both working, Raphael and, and Michelangelo are both working for, um, for Pope Julius II, who's sort of the moving force between, behind art and Rome at the time that Sebastiano arrived. But like I said, Michelangelo is sick of painting after this. He doesn't want anything more to do with it. Um, he continues to paint now and then, but it's another 20 years before he sort of gets back into it, again, because he's just so turned off by the process. He wants to get back to painting. Um, these two works were commissioned by the same person, and who was it? Della Rotary was his name. Do you know Della Rotary? Maybe, but part of the family of uh, Julius II. Commissioned both of these works for chapel, and the whole point of the title there, right? The whole point of having both of these was to but Rob it over. And again, it over with a series of drawings that Sebastiano can use to develop the composition. Even though the boy on the left does not seem to be involved, we do have a key 
forth and strength. Right? Uh, now the question is, instead of being a concert per se, are both of these pictures better understood as being young men with their tutors? Pupils learning part of the breadth of things that any Renaissance humanist needs to know. So Borgarini has painting, geometry, and music as part of his learning, symbolized by the things he's carrying. Our young boy on the right may well be in the act of learning as well, even though they seem to be much more close for us. Right? That means the fellow on the left, my so-called aging rock star, may well just be another of his educators. Right? People sometimes want him to be holding a book of music. Right? But if we look at the book, um, even though we've got a decorated cover, there's no way to identify anything about this. So when we see another book, they want to be identified, they are open and we can read them, or we can gauge what it looks like it's in them. There is nothing here to suggest anything about this book, and maybe it's just a secondary form of learning. Maybe he is going to be helping this musician. Uh, we don't know. Everything else in the image is about the music. So the rag that you see there is from when hands get swept. Right? So if he's playing long enough, and he still needs to talk and press, right? Uh, and your hands get all wet, you can't do that. So it's for what? And you get the sense he's got to right? right? He's, I love that character, right? He's just so sort of big and dominant. Um, and so uh, the rag is there for to right off. And again, there's that sense of realism. In fact, that's the loose is accurate. It has five strings and 11 tuning pins. And apparently that's spot on for period history. It has 11 different tuning pins for the five strings. Yeah. Um, I know that with other artists, people are going, okay, what chord is he playing? What notes are he playing? Because you can probably pick it up based on the fact that uh, Cariotti has given a great amount of attention not only to which string the different things are playing, um, and this way, I mean, it is a history, but you're not having this history. I mean, somebody knows the history. Please, let me just dive into this history. And tell me, what, what can you tell me? Could you make the show? Let me know what this here's, here's like. Let me know what this sounds like, right? Uh, with those fingers on those strings and those fingers plucking those strings. Giving it that great sense of, of, of realism. And there's the rag for keeping those hands clean, uh, right down to, uh, can you imagine spending time with painting every single filament um, as you're going through? Uh, and then the other objects that's here um, are extra strings, right? So if he's playing and he, and he breaks the string, he's got a little, uh, a little box there with, with extra strings. Well, this is where I thought I was going to start, was with Titian or not. So we'll figure out how to handle all of that. So Friday, right in front of the main town, um, as close to just after three as you can. Um, and then we'll be back just after five, and we'll look at some Titian pictures down there, especially some of what I'm going to talk about here to that venue. But we're we'll mostly looking at the portraits. We spent a lot of time at the portraits. So I will see you on Friday, uh, and have a good rest of the weekend again. Dive into those, dive into those, uh, papers because that's where you should be spending the majority of your energy for this.